Hi, in this video, I wanted to compare the high ISO noise performance of a full frame camera versus an APS C camera and show you an example of a scenario where it's not quite as black and white as you think. Hi, I'm Simon, a professional photographer based in the south of England, specialising in interior work and branding work, and also doing my own ICM abstract photography. The other day I had a job where I had to go and photograph an event and some of the event was outside and some of the event was inside. And the venue was an old converted mill, it was a pub and the inside was quite, they had quite low ceilings and it was quite dark, but also there wasn't masses of space. So when I was in, in there, it wouldn't be appropriate to use flash or whatever. So what camera should I take with me? My immediate thought was, Take the Sony a7R5 with my Tamron 28 to 75 zoom lens, which will give me great focal lengths. And obviously, the a7R5 being a full frame camera would be great in the low light situations. So, that was my initial thought. But as I thought about it a bit more, I found myself wanting to test whether the APS C sensor in the Fujifilm X-T5 could have actually come up with the goods and produced results that were as good as the full frame system. I ended up on that day actually using more of the Sony just because I had this in my head that it would be better for this scenario. But I did take the Fujifilm X-T5 as well and take some of the shots of those. I did find that the using the a7R5 with the Tamron lens was quite a bit heavier and I did get this sort of strange sore in my hand. I know that's a bit of sort of a, uh, a lame sort of thing to say, but the amazing thing about the Fuji system is its portability and the lightweight, which makes it great for carrying around for, you know, a multiple hours at a time. There's loads of information out there about how full frame sensors perform better than APS-C sensors when it comes to high ISO in low light conditions. And if you do direct comparisons, that's definitely true. If you compare an ISO 6400 on my a7R5 to the Fujifilm, it is better on the a7R5, no doubt. But when it comes to looking at these things, actually taking your camera out and using it for specific examples, just doing those direct comparisons isn't exactly the whole story. And the testing that I want to do later in the video shows the these sort of scenarios where that you can't just take the figures and, and the, the direct comparisons as the end of the story. As with all my videos, I'm more into sort of real world testing rather than hyper technical laboratory condition sort of testing of different scenarios. So. The test I set up won't be a clinical scientific test. It's just me testing my thoughts and answering the question whether the APS-C sensor is actually as bad as we think it is. As most people are aware, you can get a much shallower depth of field with a full frame sensor as opposed to an APS-C sensor when you compare the same aperture. Obviously, wider apertures give you a shallower depth of field and narrower apertures give you a deeper depth of field. The top end portrait lenses for full frame with 1.2 apertures give amazing wafer thin depth of field and can create brilliant separation between the subject and the background and create beautiful buttery backgrounds, which when you take it to that extreme, it's really difficult to compete with that for, on an APS-C system. But there's no doubt that with some of the APS-C lenses that are available, you can get very close to that. In the example of my event though, I didn't need to have such a narrow depth of field because I was trying to capture people interacting and I didn't want to have just one set of hands interacting and the rest be out of focus. So I was um, narrowing my aperture down to f4 and maybe even f5.6. The result was that I ended up having to push my ISO a bit higher, but obviously one wants to try and create uh, to capture the shot and not just necessarily do what's best for the technical getting the image with the, with low noise. So I wanted to keep my shutter around 100 or 125 or 125th of a second so that I could freeze motion if people were moving around and interacting. So the 
Um, the shots were, as I say, shot at, at a range of maybe some at f2.8 through to 5.6 and, and everything in between and varying the ISO to compensate for that. So thinking about my Fujifilm kit, I actually haven't got a zoom lens with a constant 2.8 aperture, but I have the 18mm f1.4, the 33mm f1.4 and the Sigma 56mm f1.4. So this brings me to the test that I set up. I set up the a7R5 with the Tamron lens set at 50 millimeters and I set the aperture to f4. And then I did a range of shots starting at uh, with an ISO of 1600 and then doubling it up to 32, 64 and then 12,800 and took the same shot and varied the shutter speed just to keep the exposure correct. And then after researching online, the equivalent or the closest that I could get to an equivalent looking shot with my APS-C size sensor Fujifilm X-T5 would be with my 33mm lens set at f2.5. So with the f2.5 on the Fuji camera setup, that's actually one and one third stops brighter than the f4 of the full frame setup. So that should enable me to use a, an ISO setting that is one and one third stop uh, brighter or less than the full frame camera. In actuality, looking at all the figures, it's somewhere between one stop and one and one third stops. But obviously with the camera, it only allows you to use one or a third of a stop setting. So I ended up taking a series of shots to mimic the ones I took on the full frame setting, but using the f2.5 on the APS-C camera and I, I did an, a comparable shot that was one stop lower on ISO and also one and one third lower on ISO and I'm going to show you all those in a minute and we can compare them and see what happened. So here we are on Capture One and uh, first off I must apologise the model I got was actually quite miserable um, and didn't look like it was into it at all so apologies for that but anyway this is my base image of 16 ISO 1600 on the Sony and I was going to compare that to the ISO 640 on the Fujifilm which due to my research earlier was the comparable ISO that should have been for that f-stop difference but it looks slightly darker so for the test in the end I ended up just comparing the image that was half the ISO setting on the Fujifilm which is probably not quite fair for the Fujifilm it's probably somewhere in between a stop and a stop and a third as I said earlier but the two images side by side you can see apart from the colour differences and the rendering differences of the two systems which we're not really looking at today we're just looking at the noise performance and I was quite pleased with the fact that the image looks quite similar in terms of depth of field and everything so if I zoomed into the miserable model you can see obviously as I said there's different renderings of images but the guitar and the background looks approximately the same slight maybe slightly more blurry on the Fujifilm side but as I say it's not completely 100% mathematically accurate and obviously the cameras probably even though they're meant to be focusing on me focus slightly differently but at that sort of ISO levels there's no real noise no problem at all anyway so let's go up to the next image which is the 3200 on the Sony. The analogous image on the Fuji would be the 1600. And then let's zoom into some of these areas. There's an area here, I thought just there, you can start to see the grain or noise of the image. And obviously these are different resolutions, these images as well. I'm trying to keep them Link. So the one on the right is the Fujifilm and that's zoomed in at 217% and the one on the left is zoomed in at 176% because it's got more pixels. So 100% on the left is probably a sensible place to zoom. But even at that 3200, it's not too bad on e either of them, uh, 1600 on the right for the Fujifilm. So let's up the ante and go to 6400 on 
the Sony and 3200 on the Fujifilm. Zooming into this area, obviously there's more noise creeping into both images, but again, it's not massively different. As I say, given that they they render the image a bit differently. Um, I'm slightly surprised in this one and a bit grumpy in this one. So that's a difference, but probably not pertinent to this test. So yeah, you can see there's maybe a tiny bit more on the right hand side on the Fujifilm in this sort of, there's a sort of patterning there. But I mean, it is there as well. I mean, there's more sort of color blotchiness over here. But again, you know, if we zoom out to the full image, you can't really see very much. And this is at 40 percent. I mean, again, still, I mean, it's amazing what modern technology allows us to do. So that's 6400 on the left and 3200 on the Fuji on the right. So let's go to the cranking it up to the max 12,800 on the Sony on the left and 6400 on the Fuji on the right. So let's go back to 100% and I haven't adjusted any settings on any of these. So this is what Capture One sees as the default settings. And obviously they're both more noisy but my point being that the Fujifilm isn't massively more noisy than the Sony and it's comparable. So my takeaway being that we don't need to worry about it too much. If you're trying to emulate the same shot given the same depth of field, so that enables you to have the wider aperture on the APS-C lens. So that is the big takeaway from this. If I was to compare the like for like Fujifilm at 12,800 as well, obviously the Fujifilm's more noisy. But we, we know that, that's a fact, and that's not really what I'm going on about here. When you're at an event, you have to just keep remembering that you can go wider on your aperture that will lead to the same depth of field as you would have had to use on a full frame camera to get the same shot. So that's my point and I was quite surprised by that and next time I have to do a job where I'm in some sort of low light as long as I know it's not ridiculous low light and I have to sort of max everything out and go and hire a 1.2 full frame lens then I know that the Fujifilm with that depth of field thought in my head is very similar to my camera that costs twice as much as the Fujifilm full frame Sony. So that was quite an illuminating test really. So I hope you found this exploration into high ISO comparison between the full frame and the APS-C interesting and maybe it helps you go forward and be confident in what you're doing and think more about the aperture you're using and the fact that you can go to a wider aperture with your APS-C camera and get a deeper depth of field so that you can benefit from that extra light that the wider aperture is collecting and not have to worry that everything's going to be out of focus apart from that person's thumb or something like that. So yeah, I hope you found this interesting and I'm sure there are loads of opinions because when we talk about the various depths of field and the comparisons between full frame and APS-C, there seems to be a lot of uh, comment and, and people's differing opinions and I didn't want to cause any consternation with anybody but it was just a scenario that seemed to open itself to me and this test seemed to confirm what I thought and it will make me more confident to go forward using the Fujifilm. As I say it's so much easier to wander about with these lovely little cameras that don't weigh so much and I think also people don't seem to see you so much as I've, I think I've said that before that you can sort of blend in and there's the whole fun aspect as well. So I've just got to keep reminding myself that I can use slightly wider apertures and still get slightly deeper depth of field and not keep thinking about it in full frame terms. So yeah, please subscribe and like this video as that really helps the channel. And hopefully I'm looking forward to 
getting up to a thousand subscribers if I can soon and that'll be a great milestone for me and I really appreciate you taking the time to watch this video and again I hope it's been really useful for you and I will see you again here soon.